debt is truly satanic. I'm going to offer you just more proof of that here in just a second. Ah, sad, actually. And look, I've got debt. This thing behind me has a debt on it. And uh, I had a, I, I thought I was going to, um, let's just put it this way. The amount of tax I just had a strike to the check, to the IRS has put me behind for where I was hoping to be to pay the sucker off. It's okay. I have my own fault. I'm just telling you, though, debt is satanic. I know it's proof pudding. I had two, two straight guys I talked to, guy yesterday in Hawaii, and guy today in New Jersey. Both have no debt. Guy yes in Hawaii is married with a couple kids. Guy in New Jersey single, no debt. Again, both have no debt. The guy in Hawaii is living in a high cost of living state. New Jersey is a high cost of living state too. However, because they both have no debt, guess what? They don't need that much income. You see what I'm saying? It's just that simple. Both in their mid to late fifties, yeah, mid to late fifties. Both hang up their boots. Both do whatever they want. The guy in New Jersey wants to go fishing. The guy in Hawaii wants to go surfing. Both can do it because they don't have that much expenses because they have no debt. Literally, it's the same story time and time and time again. I, uh, ah, so let me show you, share with you. So I was reading this morning. Where was I reading it from? Um, uh, the letter of Paul Revere, actually. Very interesting. I'll show you. Hey, read the letter of Paul Revere that he wrote. Paul Revere personally recounts his famous ride. It's, 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 a, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. All right, I just definitely read. I, you cannot, I cannot stress enough to read it. One of the things that Paul Revere talks about, let's, let me actually show you here if I can bring it up. It, I tell you, it's fascinating. It's like when you read the Eisenhower farewell speech, like, man, I had no clue. So I want to show you guys something here. Paul goes on to say, we held our meetings at the Green da Dragon Tavern. Here it is right here. Headquarters of the revolution. We were so careful that our meetings should be kept secret that every time we met, every person swore upon the Bible that he would not discover any of our transactions. But uh, Mr. Hancock, Adams, Doctors, Warren, and Church, and one or two more, they would not basically share any of their transactions to anyone else except uh, John Hancock, Sam Adams, Dr. Warren, Dr. Church, and one or two more. They swore on the Bible. Huh. About November, when things began to grow serious, a gentleman who had connections with the Tory party, but was a Whig at heart, acquainted me that our meetings were discovered and mentioned that identical words that were spoken among us that night before. We did not distrust, we did not then distrust Dr. Church, but suppose it must be someone among us. Interesting. It's called an option that, hold on a second. It was then a common opinion that there was a traitor in the Provincial Congress. Now, the Gage, who was the uh, commander of the Brits, uh, was possessed of all their secrets. Dr. Church was a member of Congress from Boston. All right, interesting. So we're starting to get something here, right? Um, let's keep going because this is interesting. You can see I'm going to, we're going to, Dr. Church. As I've mentioned, Dr. Church, perhaps it's not disagreeable to mention some matters of my own knowledge respecting him. He appeared to be a high son of liberty. He frequented all the places where they met, was encouraged by all the leaders of the Sons of Liberty, and appeared he was respected by them. Though I knew that Dr. Warren had not the greatest affection for him. He was esteemed a very capable writer, especially in verses. As, and as the Whig party needed every strength, they feared as well as courted him. Interesting. So there's Dr. Church. Um, though it was known that some of the Liberty songs which we composed were per paradised by him in favor of the British, yet none dare charge him with it. Hmm. I was a constant and critical observer of him, and I must say I never thought him a man of principle. I doubted much in my own my, uh, mind whether he was a true Whig. Dr. Church frequently dined with British Tories, essentially, the governors, and I know that one of his intimate acquaintances asked him why he was so often with the Brits. And his answer was that he kept company with them on purpose to find out their plans. The day after the Battle of Lexington, I came across him in Cambridge. When he I, I came uh, the, uh, the day after the battle, when he showed me some blood on his stocking, which he said spirited on him from a man who was killed near him as he was urging the militia on. I well remember that I, as I argue with myself, if a man will risk his life in a cause, he must be a friend of that cause. And I never suspected him after till he was charged of being a traitor. Interesting. Uh, let's see. The Friday evening after about sunset, I was sitting with some or nearly all the committee in their room, which was Mr. Hayding's house in Cambridge. Dr. Church all at once started up. 
And he said, I'm determined to go to Boston tomorrow. And Dr. Warren said, why? Surely you're not serious. If you do and they catch you, they're going to hang you. And Dr. Church said, I am serious. I'm determined to go on all adventures. Hmm. After a considerable conversation, Dr. Warren said, well, if you're determined, let us make some business for you. And they agreed that, uh, they, so they talked about arrangements. All right. Anyway, the point being was, out that Dr. Church was a traitor. He was. A, uh, he was giving information to General Gage. So check this out. We're going to read up about Dr. Church. Dr. Benjamin Church. He was the chief physician and director general of the Continental Army. He was the first surgeon general, this guy. He was effectively the first surgeon general of the United States. However, early in the American Revolution, he was sending secret information to General Thomas Gage, the British commander. Huh. What, 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 what's up with that? Evidence that during the time period when the revolution was getting going, as it was getting friction, that he was variously considered an ardent patriot and a secret Tory sympathizer. He examined the body of Christmas addicts and treated some of the wounded in the Boston Massacre. In 1774, he's elected a delegate to the Massachusetts Provincial Congress. Interesting. Uh, on May, uh, after the Revolutionary War began, he became a member of the examining board for surgeons of the army. Huh. What's up with that, man? In July 1775, he sent a he sent a cipher letter addressed to Major Kane, who is a Brit officer in Boston, through a former mistress. This letter was intercepted by another of the woman's ex-lovers. This is the whole thing, like, oh, they were so religious back then. No, they weren't. And it was sent to George Washington in September. When two teams of gentlemen decoded it, they found it contained an account of American forces before Boston. Uh, though of no great disclosure, it did, however, declare Church's devotions to the crown and ask for directions for his correspondence. All right, he says, well, I was just doing it for you guys, but it turns out, check this out. Read Dr. Church's course, his defense, I should say. You're like, yeah, I can see what he's talking about. But later, when scholars are able to open General Gage's files earlier in the 20th, 20th century, they discovered letters with significant intelligence about the American forces that could only have come from Church. The, f the files included notes that had been entrusted to him to carry into and out of Boston. Until then, historians had difficulty estimating the degree of Church's guilt. It is now clear he was supplying the Brits uh, with information in early 1775. Why? Because he was deeply in debt and needed the money. And let's go back to what uh, uh, Paul Revere said. I'm after perhaps a year or two uh, after the war, I fell in company with a gentleman who studied with Church. In discoursing about him, I related what I'd mentioned above. He said he did not doubt that he was in uh, the interests of the British, and that it was, he was he who informed General Gage that he knew for certain that a short time before the Battle of Lexington, uh, so basically saying, hey, this is what the, the Americans are doing. Uh, this guy said uh, Dr. Church had no money by him, but he was much drove for it. He was driven by it. Then all at once, he had several hundred new British guineas, and, he, and that he thought would at the time where they came from. Yeah. What happened here, the guy wanted to be wealthy. He was not happy with his lot in life, and he wanted to be wealthy, and he was spending money he did not have, so he had tons of debts. So he literally sold his country for money. That's debt, to pay off his debts, to live large, to spend beyond his means. That's debt. He sold his country. He swore the Bible he would not do that, and he did. And you just look throughout history, man. People have done that. Just it, How many men have died because of the debts of kings and rulers? It's insanity. How many marriages have been divorced because uh, ended? How many children have been left without a dad in their home because of debts? It's nuts, man. You know what I know. We all know it. How many workplaces have you had to adhere to because of freaking LGBTQ, PT, RQ, Y, Z, all this crap, plus wokeness, CRT, all this stuff, but you had to bite your tongue because you're so heavy in debt. Dude, I know it. When you have debt, you will do what they tell you. Why do you think the George H.W. Bush's team, when they took over from Reagan, they said, we don't want ideologues. We want people with a mortgage because people in a mortgage, we can make them in line, aligned with our views, which is a globalist cabal. So let's just go to some Bible stuff here. Um, I think this is pretty interesting, actually. Um, 
The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is a slave to the lender. We all know that one, Proverbs 22, 7. Romans 13, 18. Who wrote Romans? Huh? Owe no one anything except to love each other for the one. Uh, not, that's not what I want. Right here. Psalm, uh, well, that's good. No, but no, there he goes. He does say, oh, no one anything, Paul. Oh, no one anything except to love each other for the, and for the one who loves one another has fulfilled the law. Um, from the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it or not? Matthew, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Then Deuteronomy, the Lord will open to you his good treasury, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in a season and to bless all the work of your hands. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. Why? Because a borrower is a slave to the lender. And the only one person thing you should be a slave to, which is the creator. Uh, wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers it little by little will increase it. Yep. Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never forsake you. Ah, just so much, man. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money nor he who loves wealth with his income. This is vanity. Yeah. Um, Jesus talks about more about money than he talks about anything else in the Bible. Certainly about uh, lust, uh, gluttony, he talks about money. Because the, the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money, the love of money. And we all, look, this is stuff we all know. But again, remember, and that's the thing with Benedict Arnold. Everyone thinks Benedict Arnold was a massive traitor. He wasn't a traitor for money like Dr. Church. Arnold he was a traitor because Congress sucked back then as it does now. And he had soldiers who needed to be uh, cared for with food, provisions, and Congress wasn't delivering. And I don't look at Benedict Arnold as a traitor at all, not the least. I do look at Benjamin Church as a traitor. And I'm going to talk about another traitor here in just a second. Well, she'll prove you that there's a globalist cabal. Um, and I said what happened to Benjamin, Dr. Church, too, by the way. Fit again. So let's just read what happened to this guy. Um, because, uh, let's see, on, uh, so he was in jail. He was, uh, uh, let's see, uh, the Continental, da, 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 the Dr. Church be close confined in some secure jail in the colony of Connecticut when they found him guilty without the use of a pen, ink, and paper and that no person should be allowed to converse with him except in the presence and hearing of the magistrate. Um, in accordance with this resolution, Church was confined at Norwich, Connecticut. Becoming ill, he was released from jail a year later uh, in 1776 and was permitted considerable movement uh, under guard. On May 13th, he returned to Massachusetts under bond. He remained in prison until 1778 and then was named to the Massachusetts Banishment Act of that year. Shortly thereafter, he sailed from Boston, presumably for Martinique, yeah, but the vessel in which he took passage was never heard from again. That's sad. He was married. He had a wife. I'm not sure if he had any kids or anything. He was married to Hannah Hill. And uh, you know, he just sold his soul for rock and roll because he had debts and he wanted to live beyond his means. Sad. Sad. Debt is satanic. That's what Satan wants you to do, to take on debt. Instead of being patient, I need it now. Look, I'm there. I'm, I got debt. I have it right now. And I hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it. Oh, I hate it so bad. All right. Love your thoughts. We'll see you.